Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our monthly Ready Special Populations Roundtable Talk. Today's topic is about race and ethnicity with a focus on our Hispanic and Latino Latina community. Before we begin, we'd like to share a bit about the CTSC. The Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative, or CTSC, of Northern Ohio is a collaborative among Case Western Reserve University and its affiliated hospital systems. The Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, University Hospitals, and the Lewis Stokes Veterans Administration Medical Center, Northeast Ohio Medical University, and the University of Toledo. We aspire to be a catalyst for high quality clinical and translational science and transformative research to positively impact the health of those in Northern Ohio and beyond. As we plan for the continued evolution of the CTSC, health equity takes center stage. In the 2023 through 2030 grant cycle, our CTSC is focusing particularly on including the community in the process of clinical and translational research to better address health disparities and achieve equity. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Elisio Perez Estable is director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. He earned his Bachelor's of the Arts in Chemistry in 1974 and Medical Doctorate in 1978 from the University of Miami. He then completed his primary care internal medicine residency and a research fellowship in general internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, before joining the faculty as an assistant professor in 1983. Dr. Perez Estable practiced primary care internal medicine for 37 years at UCSF. His research interests have centered on improving the health of individuals from racial and ethnic minority communities through effective prevention interventions, understanding underlying causes of health disparities, and advancing patient-centered care for underserved populations. Recognized as a leader in Latino healthcare and disparities research, he spent 32 years leading research on smoking cessation and tobacco control in Latino populations in the United States and Latin America. Dr. Perez Estable has published more than 300 peer-reviewed papers. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Giselle. And uh, I will be uh, speaking for about 20, 25 minutes at most, and then we'll have a conversation. I know you have some questions you're interested in asking, and uh, I think that'll be a, a great way to, to, to launch into this. So um, uh, let me go ahead and share my, my screen and show you the slides that I have prepared to share with you today on Latino health and get this into slideshow. Okay. So you heard about my background. I'm a general internist uh, and had practiced medicine until I moved to NIH uh, just a little bit over eight years ago to uh, be the director of the NIMHD. And I'll start with, you know, the general, I'm de delighted to hear that your, your organization is focused on equity. Uh, and so I like to say, well, what can science do to reduce inequities? What, what, what are we good at that we can work towards this? So first we need to measure things the same way in a standardized way. A lot of these social and demographic factors really influence health a lot as I'll share. Uh, and we we cannot afford to have people do it differently or do it their favorite way. We have to agree. Uh, the field needs a lot more talent in data science. Uh, there's discovery potentially to be made in, in big data, uh, both from electronic health records, genomics and basic sciences, and uh, social factors in population data. So this is an area that we, we lack uh, uh, individuals with a equity disparities lens to be into. We need to be an engine to promote diversity of the workforce because uh, here we are in 2023 and 14% of physicians and 14% of newly minted PhDs uh, in any uh, uh, life sciences, including uh, social sciences, uh, are from underrepresented race and ethnic groups and this 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 has to change we we are a third of the u.s population and this gap is not decreasing uh, at, at any at any pace so everything we can do to remedy that within the constraints that exist now from the legal side 
that we need to cultivate community engagement. This is a, a model of research. It's not just being nice to, to our uh, constituents or our populations. We really need to look at community engaged methods as a research methodology that needs support, needs support in order to build this trust and have sustainable relationships with the communities. And then we need to do better implementation science. There are things we know what to do and yet we don't do them and we often don't do them do them worse in the people that suffer the most. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a, a major concern. NIH has a series of populations that are designated to be population with health disparities. I am the person who is authorized to designate uh, population groups as those having health disparities. The first three on this list were uh, in the law that established the center of um, the, the National Center for Minority Health on Minority Health and Health Disparities in the year 2000, which by the way was championed by Congressman Stokes, uh, uh, who was a major champion of, uh, of our institute. Um, and then uh, in 2016, we added sexual and gender minorities or LGBTQ plus populations. And just this week, persons with disabilities. A unifying factor here in all of these populations is in part they're subject to discrimination or racism and also being underserved in healthcare. Uh, and there are other populations that would fit that category uh, maybe not be described under these uh, titles or these descriptors, but still would be uh, relevant to consider the unifying theme of discrimination. The Institute's priorities, however, are founded in race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. These are the fundamental pillars of, of the science of health disparities from our perspective, and we will prioritize these factors. Uh, therefore, in other populations, not just those who are designated as having health disparities, but also other people, you know, any condition, uh, people with diabetes or with arthritis uh, or heart failure um, or issues around maternal uh, and child health, uh, we are interested in the intersectionality of race and ethnicity and or socioeconomic status with these populations and not those populations exclusively. So, that's a more of internal uh, process. Uh, it's essentially what we've been doing, uh, but um, I think with this expansion of, uh, of populations with disparities over the last seven years, uh, it was important to reiterate that. And that statement is, is the link is on, on the slide. Um, we also wanna reevaluate what we've been doing for, for years and years, which is to compare everything to whites. Uh, whites are the majority population in the US still will be for probably at least another decade or, or so. 60% uh, of the U.S. is white, self-identifies as white. But whites don't always have the best outcomes. And this idea that, you know, we reference the, the, the majority population, that makes some sense, but um, perhaps we ought to be creating aspirational uh, goals that the country needs to aim for and then base these on national metrics, and then we can compare any group to that. So let's talk about Latinos or Hispanics as the official uh, OMB census uh, names. Um, I'm from Cuba myself, so I'm from Latin America. I'm an immigrant. I came as a child to the US. I've lived in Latin America a couple of years, uh, different times of my life since I left Cuba as a, as a child. Um, Latin America has been a laboratory of mixture of populations for 500 years. Uh, not unlike the United States, except the U.S. has been more segregated. Um, the indigenous people in Latin America were not wiped out or marginalized completely. Uh, you know, 50% of Mexico is essentially indigenous. Most of the people are mixed. Uh, if you go to Mexico City, you, you can see that right away. And then in different parts of the continent of the Latin America and the Caribbean, you see different mixtures of indigenous, European, mostly Spanish, but not exclusively, some Asian, uh, some Middle Eastern, um, as well as the African uh, population that was brought, forcibly brought to the, to the Americas um, with the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I would say that Latinos in the US are more similar than different, even though 
20 heritage groups or national origin groups, if you count the number of countries, people will refute that or, or, or take the opposite view. Uh, for a colleague, Latino researcher colleague who say, oh, there's nothing more different than a Mexican and a Puerto Rican. And so it's a perspective of whether you agree or disagree, that's my, my perspective. I think there's unifying components of culture. Um, there's language. Most people speak Spanish or have a root in speaking Spanish. But there's also the influence of the Catholic Church. Uh, it's a consequence of the colonial influence of Spain and Portugal in particular. And then there is the uh, juxtaposition to the United States, which has been the dominant um, political, economic, and military power in the Western Hemisphere. And all of Latin America has had this kind of relationship the U.S., a little bit of love-hate, if you wish, um, that uh, is a unifying factor for people in Latin America. Uh, switching to the U.S., you can see that um, the census, uh, OMB, have proposed eliminating the two questions that everyone uses right now is, are you Hispanic or Latino, and, and then race categories, and everyone says non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic this. Uh, so hopefully that will end. Uh, I'm in favor of this. Uh, there are others who aren't, um, uh, but it looks like it's going to go through based on the conversations, uh, uh, briefings I've been uh, part of. Uh, so we'll now be, how do you identify yourself and offer seven categories and put Hispanic Latino as one of those categories. There's an added category of Middle Eastern North African, and they will no longer offer a multiracial category as the primary one but we'll derive that based on how many boxes people check. Uh, in 2020, 10% uh, of uh, adults per their algorithm uh, were considered multiracial um, and Latinos were the most frequently noted. I think I counted as multiracial because I said I was white and Latino. Uh, so if there's something to be looked at what's under the hood of how they account for this. This is dated from 2013, but just an example of where the different national heritage or national origin groups in, in the U.S. of Latinos are. Mexicans are by far the most uh, numerous, uh, accounting for about two-thirds of all Latinos in the U.S. Um, and then uh, Puerto Ricans are generally uh, second. Uh, Cubans and Central Americans are really uh, kind of third. And Dominicans are right up there as well. You can see that the level of education is much lower than among whites and African-Americans, for that matter, number who don't complete high school. Some of this, a lot of this is related to immigrants, but not all. Percent limited English speaking as low as 17 percent among Puerto Ricans, as high as almost half of Central Americans who would not qualify as having uh, being English fluent. Uh, that's a response to the to the question about how well do you speak English, you have to say very well um, uh, in order to not be considered limited English proficient. Uh, people who say well can maybe may be able to manage what in English okay, but it, you need a follow up question to, to figure that out. And then the percent poverty. So even let's say Cubans are considered more successful economically. Uh, Twenty percent are below poverty in 2013. All these numbers, I'm sure, are different now. I didn't uh, don't have uh, national data to compare that to. And Latinos also, since I started doing research uh, um, 40 years ago, uh, say that have this epidemiological paradox. Despite lower, uh, less education, uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, overall, and all these other the social and demographic barriers. Their, their outcomes are better than expected uh, based on the normal predictive factors. And in fact, um, it, it breaks the, the model, the, the paradigm to say, you're, you're poor, you're gonna have worse health. Now that's not entirely true, but for the big picture, life expectancy, mortality, leading causes of death, this is held up uh, undoubtedly. And even, even if it deteriorates some as it did with COVID, it's still better uh, than people would expect. Now, there is a, uh, not a theory, but a hypothesis that this is all due to the healthy immigrant effect and it will go away. There's data to support that, um, that uh, U.S. born Latinos have uh, higher mortality rates, particularly if they're Afro Latinos. However, 70% um, of Latinos in the U.S. living today uh, were born in the United States. So 
uh, we haven't seen too much deterioration in these factors uh, with that. So it may it may take longer. These are data that we published on life expectancy in the U.S. by race and ethnicity in collaboration with the Institute for Health Metric Evaluation. The highest, the longest life expectancy is for Asians. Um, and the, the, recently, this became clear as national, so national estimates of life expectancy and mortality were finally um, uh, arrived at by the CDC and the National Center for Health Statistics. Latinos uh, are right here. They're, they're pretty good. Now, you said COVID put a big dent into this, particularly for Latinos and African-Americans, and you're right. Uh, but I, I expect much of that to recover. But we will see what happens over the next couple of years. Uh, the loss of two years for Latinos, let's say, would still leave the Latino life expectancy higher. And then you can see for the other groups, particularly American Indian, Alaska Natives are, are doing much worse. The relationship of socioeconomic status, or in this case, illustration of income and overall health is 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 robust. And you know, I would say that this is probably the biggest missing factor in clinical research is people don't know, don't ask, uh, not to say don't care what someone's socioeconomic status is. And yet it's so important in not only in influencing their ultimate health in a population, so certainly from a public health side, but also in how you talk to people and what level of sophistication you use to explain things, uh, what concerns may they have in terms of taking on a medicine that will cost $100 a month in copay, uh, and so these are these are factors I think to keep in mind when you, and then to illustrate the issue of stratification, this is really important and we can't always do it. We usually have to have large databases to do it. Just an example of that. Uh, so this the prevalence of obesity among youth by education of the head of household. So using education of the head of household as a as a proxy for socioeconomic status of the household. And so when you have the two extremes, so college educated. Uh, on, on the left column by uh, both male, female and, and race, ethnic, race, racial and ethnic group on, the le on, on this side, uh, compared to the uh, least educated to the most educated. So this is less than high school compared to college degree. And you see the improvement, the, lo the decrease in adolescent um, and youth obesity. Uh, but that even though the, the, the absolute decrease is similar, let's say for white males and black males, uh, you're still worse off as a black male uh, with a college degree household uh, almost than you, than you were in a white household with a high school degree. Not, not that much better off is what I'm, uh, I'm pointing out. So the absolute decrease may be similar, but you're starting off from worse levels. Uh, and for females, this is even more evident both for Latinas and, uh, and for Blacks. NIMHD has um, worked hard to create a, at least a resource for uh, standardized measures on social determinants of health. Uh, this is part of the Phoenix Toolkit uh, website at NIH, you see the link there. We have a, a, a website, a web page, I should say, that's there. The demographics and individual determinants are mostly gathered from what already existed, although we are reviewing those now. Um, but there, and especially with the OMB change that will need to be updated. But we've worked a lot on, on uh, protocols as the, as the Phoenix uh, terminology for this uh, for structural social determinants. And I list the new ones that were added most recently in December of 2022. Uh, we have what we call a core collection, things that we recommend that everyone should collect on all uh, research participants and then uh, additional protocols that people can use. There are other institutes that use Phoenix and, and, and have standardized measures for some of their uh, interest areas, like tobacco use or behavioral issues, depression, substance use, and things of that kind. Uh, hopefully you've all uh, seen the research framework, a socio-ecological model with different levels of influence and domains of influence. I think uh, one of the main things uh, we introduced here was to highlight the importance of the healthcare system. Um, keep in mind, almost half of U.S. adults over the age of 50 take a medicine every day. Um, a healthcare system becomes important as you develop a chronic condition or have an acute problem, of course. Um, and for people who are healthy and don't have a chronic condition, you, you rarely interact with the health system except for prevention or getting a, a particular service. 
the social cultural environment we've known about for decades, you know, interacting with people, community uh, is good for your health. Um, and then the physical built environment the information really exploded after 2020, after the in the in the 21st century, uh, and and continues to grow. So what's the importance of the built environment? And of course now we're dealing with climate change and health, and that's another factor that that re responds in this category. And biology and behavior, of course, are are relevant. I think in our institute we still fund most grants in this first column. We're very individual focused. Some are interpersonal, family or households, and some are community level. Uh, but we, as we move to the right of this framework, my right, uh, you really see fewer and fewer grants. And that's partly because they're harder to do or maybe harder to think about conceiving them, getting them through the NIH review uh, process. Um, uh, I won't talk a lot about COVID today, but I will mention SEAL, the Community Engage Alliance Against COVID-19. Uh, we stood this up in 2020 uh, as a response to uh, the crisis and getting communities of color motivated to engage in clinical research, particularly the vaccine trials uh, and other drug trials related to COVID, but also um, later to uptake the vaccine and to provide factual uh, information uh, to combat the misinformation. We, our our uh, mantra was move at the speed of trust. Uh, we really targeted um, racial and ethnic minority communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic. So our display of where we are funding 21 teams that really intend to be regional or statewide coalitions uh, reflect that. Uh, this is not, not in, has not been strategized as a national network uh, as we uh, move out of the pandemic into sort of more chronic existence of COVID, we think about community-engaged research as, a, as an important uh, research platform, as I mentioned earlier, and what will SEAL do? And we're, we're, we're modifying it to shift to focus on chronic disease. Um, uh, the, we also emphasize the partnership nature of SEAL uh, with community organizations that really uh, encompasses a, a new approach or, or, or the, the kind of guidance that we intend for this kind of research. Uh, I want to mention the issue of racism or discrimination. Uh, this is real and we, of course, uh, are aware of that. Uh, needs to be thought about, factored in, in everything uh, that we do in terms of research as well as clinical care. These are data, again, that are dated, but uh, I haven't seen a, an update from the Kaiser Family Foundation Survey of Americans on race from uh, not quite, uh, eight, from about eight years ago. And you see that asking about the past 30 days here, not lifetime, sorry, um, you see that were you treated unfairly in any of these contexts? And over half of African-Americans responded yes, but if over a third of Latinos also said yes. Uh, compared to 15% of whites. And of course, we do much better in healthcare as we should, uh, but it's not uh, it's not zero or down to the 5% level that you see for whites. So how does racism discrimination play out among Latinos? Um, it, not often, you know, we often focus about African-Americans in terms of racism, although uh, having lived in California for 37 years, it, it, it's a different perspective there. Uh, for Latinos have the highest rate of uninsured in the U.S., have had for decades and continue to post-ACA. Uh, it's double the rate for white than for whites and almost, you know, more than double than it is for Asians and higher than for African-Americans. So we're about 20 percent uninsured um, of any type, uh, including Medicaid. Uh, so that means less access, worse management of certain chronic conditions, and uh, dependent on you know charity care, community clinics, uh, the, especially on the specialty side, because I think in primary care we we do a, a decent job of covering the uninsured. Um, immigration status is a big deal for Latinos. There's a stereotypical discrimination. Okay, you're brown, so you probably are undocumented or illegal. Uh, this leads individuals to fear, uh, to participate, to mistrust in research. And I think that, you know, uh, lowering that, uh, that tension is important. Um, uh, confronting people and asking them, or you have legal papers, you know, is not the way to go about it. I don't have a magical answer. We don't usually ask, 
uh, you can derive it by asking about whether they have, you know, uh, ex the exclusion factors. Were you born? Where were you born? And do you have residency in the U.S.? And, and in studies have done that successfully without losing trust. Uh, and, and in clinical care, uh, most times people just don't ask. Um, of course, if you're not uh, a legal resident in the United States, you're not eligible for a lot of the programs like Medicaid or, or other uh, you know, regionally based coverages. Uh, and, and so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, English language proficiency is another major issue. It limits employment options, not just if they're not, if someone's not fluent, but also um, the pronunciation or their, their uh, ability to be understood. Uh, and that factors into people's eligibility. So uh, this is a, a factor that keeps the socioeconomic status differences uh, uh, there where they are. And Latinos are, are, have a high presence in the service industries, um, both in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the hospitality industry, as well as in construction, for example, uh, where frequently uh, these factors aren't, uh, aren't considered uh, as important. But in other kind of, you know, desk jobs, service jobs in, in, uh, in organizations and, uh, that, that often require a certain level of, of, uh, of, of communicating effectively up and down uh, the hierarchy, uh, Latinos are shut out because of this. Um, there's also this stereotype of people who have darker skin, um, uh, you know, in my case, that doesn't play out, although people do notice something different. Um, uh, maybe the hair, maybe just the, the way I, I, I behave, as I've been told. Uh, but non-European features, if you're mixed with indigenous uh, communities, you don't look the same. Um, the height is lower. People have a higher BMI. They have a different body shape. And all these affect individual differences. So it's not just about the, the skin tone. Uh, discrimination, racism, which also happens with Latinos. There are Afro-Latinos uh, is estimated to be about 10% of the Latino population in the U.S. would be considered Black uh, in their home country. Uh, now, the other topic in research in Latinos is acculturation. What's the role of acculturation? And there's this widespread belief um, based on some data that if you acculturate, then you'll get bad habits, experience more chronic stress, and lose your mortality advantage. So this, this healthier immigrant effect will go away with time. We're waiting for that because it hasn't happened yet. And I think the way I would tell my colleagues in Latino research is be empirical. Don't just assume this belief that someone put out it makes sounds good as an interesting theory, but collect data and see if it holds up. Now, I would say that for behavioral things where we have done uh, a lot of data collection related to uh, let's say alcohol use and smoking, um, women in particular, as they acculturate, uh, drink more alcohol and smoke more uh, among Latina women. Um, uh, they start off from a very low rate of smoking and increase to a higher rate. Doesn't mean they're smoking at an at a extremely high rate. And so this that, that's empirically based and, and supported. Um, there's some trends in mortality that I, I told you about earlier that the U.S. born Latinos have a higher um, mortality than, than immigrants, although it's still lower than whites by a significant amount. Uh, so um, keep that in mind. Um, and then there, the data from H and, and uh, Hispanic Haynes that showed nonlinear smoking rates by education. So normally we see this decrease in smoking as you, as you get more educated. You didn't see that with Latinos uh, in, uh, in, in uh, these national surveys. Um, and, and I think that the answer is in accounting for socioeconomic status. So if you're an immigrant and you be, and you become and you stay uh, what we call less acculturated, uh, and, but you move up the socioeconomic ladder because maybe you have skills, you're a professional, you have a su successful business or whatever, um, your health actually uh, remains uh, well. Uh, but if you become very acculturated, uh, but your socioeconomic status either degrades or, or stays low, uh, your health gets worse. So it's a dynamic process. I don't think it's solely acculturation, but SES uh, really matters. We, we're working with the Hispanic Community Health Study study on Latino data to try and, and decipher some of this related to hypertension and diabetes, and the paper's close to being uh, submitted. Uh, we Sociologists have called this segmented, segmented assimilation. So 
it's acculturation is not a linear phenomena. Um, and then, you know, then you might say, well, what about being bicultural like me? Uh, I, you know, that's, that's uh, also unknown territory. Some data would imply higher levels of stress. You don't fit in either culture. You, you're, you're getting chronic stress from both. And others would imply the opposite. You get the, the best of both. Uh, just empirical data that we looked at a number of years ago, one of my uh, postdocs at UCSF, looking at uh, incident diabetes in the Hispanic epidemiologic surveys uh, that uh, Coco Marquitas was the PI on. Uh, these are funded by age, National Institute on Aging. Uh, and again, if you spoke Spanish and had low SES uh, going from first to third generation, you had a higher risk of developing diabetes. Even though you remain less acculturated, your low SES really was more, uh, was more powerful in, in the third generation. Uh, and you spoke English, uh, you responded to the survey in English, you had higher SES, which really just meant being having health insurance and graduating from high school in this study, um, and going from first to third generation, you had a lower risk of incident diabetes. So these are new cases of, of identified diabetes. So um, uh, we're working with this soul data, as I mentioned earlier, to look at this again. So in the clinical research or in the clinical encounter, people who don't speak English well use interpreters, right? So when you use an interpreter, well, I should say, you should always use a professional interpreter. It should really be, uh, you know, malpractice, illegal, whatever negative term you want to use to not use a professional interpreter. But even with professional interpreters, uh, patients or participants will ask less, say less, and answer less. So the quality of the care uh, is is not good at all with no interpreter, with no professional interpreter, it is less good with a professional interpreter than with language concordant care. Uh, and that, I think there's good empirical evidence to support these statements. Uh, and if you think about it, if you're seeing a patient uh, with an interpreter, it'll take twice as long. So you don't get twice as much time, usually, although some systems are beginning to do that. Uh, it costs, it, you do half as much. So you take care of the technical things like prescriptions and, and tests and diagnosis and things like that and lose out on the on the relationship soft part of, of building relationship with patients. Uh, I already put the point about professional. Uh, it's a matter of quality. Uh, there is technology available to facilitate this. And, and clinicians who say, oh, I speak Spanish should be uh, tested and certified and then compensated, uh, or at least a, you know, a group compensation uh, for it. 65% uh, of people who don't speak English at home in the U.S. Uh, speak Spanish. So the predominant language where this is a challenge is in Spanish, but uh, Cantonese and uh, numerous other languages also are an issue. I, allude, I alluded earlier about the diversity challenge. Um, language concordance is not strictly on an issue of race and ethnicity, but uh, it clearly is part of this. Uh, we don't know what diverse uh, biomedical scientific workforce does for science. Uh, we think it's better biomedical research. It's not based on this, that, that, that assumption is based is uh, implied by some research looking at you know authors and impact factor of papers, uh, but the, we are interested in seeing whether or not having diverse research teams leads to better research, better quality research, um, and that's a premise I think that will help promote more diversity uh, around, uh, especially with the legal barriers that that exist, um, and then think of diversity not as oh, everyone's different, we value everyone because they're different. Think of what we are trying to do here is really think about who has been uh, differentially excluded because of their background. Um, and that's what our programs really should be aiming for. Um, and not necessarily just, oh, you're, you're different than me and therefore, you know, your food's going to be different. I really think that's great. You know, that, that's a different kind of perspective from, our, from the NMHD one. Uh, in terms of recruiting uh, participants, uh, perhaps you're all very familiar with sort of approach. So we, you don't recruit without a plan, right? So I think people need to have a plan. So in this condition, uh, let's say heart failure, uh, you know that African-Americans, let's say, have more heart failure or in diabetes, we know Latinos have more diabetes. So in your plan, you should tailor your plan. So you say, okay, we're going to get X percent 
uh, we're going to aim for this goal, whether it be equal cells or proportional to demography or proportional to your patient uh, population, uh, but not just generic recruitment. You need to tailor recruitment strategies and have a plan and be able to pause uh, when you succeed, when you fill a, a group, pause that and, and to make sure you, you, you get to where you wanted to go. Not at the end say, oh, we tried, which is the most common response we get. How many PIs of NIH grants, uh, you know, fulfill their their recruitment table that they submit in their successful grant? I, we've never actually done that uh, because no one has the time. But I would bet that a majority of principal investigators don't don't come close to recruiting the minority populations that they expected to recruit because they get anxious about not meeting their sample size and get everybody and try to get everybody recruited. Some of that can be addressed by upfront addressing this with a plan and to be intentional. I think having a diverse investigator team matters. And then you, you, it, it is now the policy of the New England Journal of Medicine that if you send them a, a results of a big clinical trial um, uh, on a condition that disproportionately affects certain populations in the US, you have to justify why that population isn't well represented in your sample. Uh, and uh, and let's see how how that influences what investigators, including industry, which by the way, um, has much more of a problem in this than NIH funded researchers. Uh, just general ideas, uh, ways to promote health equity, reduce disparities. Uh, again, expanding access matters, not just insurance, but also having a clinician. The ACA experiment worked. Uh, it was a step in the major step in the right direction. Uh, although it didn't solve the problem uh, by any stretch of the imagination, that we need public health consensus. Uh, when we have that, we, we need to implement it, and we don't. Uh, hypertension is a great example. We know what to do. Uh, we know how to get 80% of people or more uh, with a blood pressure under 140 over 90, not even the stricter uh, guidelines that exist now. And yet, uh, who has the least well control? Blood pressure, Latinos and African Americans uh, before age 65, uh, because they don't have insurance, because they, they, they adherence, cost of medicines, et cetera. Coordination of care, I think, has a lot of potential. Uh, Patient-centered care, so the importance of primary care, leveraging alpha IT uh, to, to really uh, improve access. And uh, this is before telemedicine. I think now with telemedicine, you can sort of see how that can really be both either um, lead to greater disparities or improve access. And finally, just to say about community engagement, it's really, I think we, I'm working hard to make sure that this is here to stay. My, my colleague, uh, Gary Gibbons, the director of NHLBI is having a big institute. You know, we, we're on this mission to do this. Uh, I think it's the only way to uh, really move the needle on some things but it also really helps on many um, micro issues related to um, research at NIH uh, and things that we want to do. And all of these things really matter. So I'll stop. Let me stop sharing and end the slideshow. And happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fantastic information. I know some of the key points that are resonating in my mind is just about stereotypes, assumptions, bias, and just um, a lack of understanding. And the communication kind of comes top of mind for me um, and just my personal desire to learn Spanish and be able to communicate, learn American Sign Language, and just you know be this uber communicator for and with everyone. So when we think about our study teams and some actionable steps that they can take in the short term, so let's say over the next year, what are your recommendations on kind of limited English proficiency and how we can meet that need so that we can effectively communicate with individuals who speak Spanish? Well, <clears throat> you know, it starts by asking, right? So one, one should not assume that um, someone, because they, they appear to speak English, that they're fluent. Um, there was a tendency for a time that people who had limited English proficiency didn't want to say so because they knew they would need a translator or interpreter 
and that would take lo longer or that they would be treated differently. So they were worried about discrimination on that basis and, and not without a reason to be worried. But it, there are two questions you can ask about, you know, how well these, the one from the census, how well do you speak English? You can add the category of fluent, like a, like a native, check, that's it, you're done. And then, you know, it's very well, well, uh, not well and not at all. And anyone who does less than very well uh, should be considered at risk for limited English proficiency. We did empirically a, a question where we asked the second question, uh, what language do you prefer to have your health care in? And, and, though, and that, that got to, okay, you prefer Spanish. So even you say you speak English well, you prefer Spanish. So if you can get them an, either a professional interpreter or a, or a, um, uh, or a concordant uh, clinician, that, that, would, that would work. That was done in a clinical setting. I think it's eminently uh, translatable to a research setting. Um, and if you're gonna have uh, any substantial number of non-English, Spanish speaking Latinos or who prefer materials in Spanish, you need to have uh, those things professionally translated and available. Uh, I think it's pretty routine to do that at NIH. I was, I'm pleased um, it, we, you know, that that's there. Uh, and it's not dependent on, well, here it is in English, get someone to kind of translate it on the spot for you. Um, and that doesn't also take away from, you know, being, we need to be, to simplify some of these things, like consent forms that are six pages long are not good for anyone. And, and yet we're required at times to do that. We really need to sort of center that around the what the patient, you know, what's good for the patient, good for the research participant, and not just uh, making sure that our uh, attorneys are happy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. Do we have any questions in the chat or from the audience? Please feel free to take yourself off of mute. And while we're giving you a bit of time to think about your questions, here's a follow-up. At the beginning, you had noted that you are authorized to designate health disparities populations. So when we think about the recent publication or a notification to the public, I should say, about individuals with disabilities. Can you share a little bit about intersectionality with the Hispanic and Latino community right. uh, disabilities and how that impacts um, access to care, therefore access to research? So I'll start by saying that a lot of this process is political and just, and, and just keep that in mind. So the, the law from the year 2000 that Congressman Stokes uh, was the champion of uh, in the Congress, in the House, um, uh, lists the director of NIMHD in consultation with the director of HRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, we have the authority to decide whether uh, a future population at that time would be designated as having health disparities. But the fundamental of the law was really based on race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and rurality, uh, which is an important, don't get me wrong, a very important geographic factor to consider uh, was added as part of the sausage making in Congress. So unlike what we're experiencing this week, uh, there was bipartisan support and cross the aisle discussions. Senator Frist was uh, the, uh, um, the 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 majority leader in the Senate at the time he was a um, or I think, I'm sure he's I think he's still alive a cardio cardiothoracic surgeon from the senator from Tennessee and he they came up with you know rural rural populations and that will get bipartisan support and they did they got this through the Senate when the Senate was Republican and the House was Democrat so that aside um, when I arrived at NIH in 2015. I was informed, uh, by the way, we're going to, we want to declare sexual and gender minorities as population with disparities. Do you agree with it? I mean, that was like a, an email within five days of my arrival at NIH. And <laughs> I said, I don't know, you know, how did you come to this conclusion and turn to my staff? And then they kind of said, yeah, yeah, we agree with it. And, and there was resistance on the part of the secretary at the time, um, the OASH, the, uh, you know, the assistant secretary of health who's like the chief medical person in the department. Um, uh, since we haven't had a physician or a clinician secretary since 
um, the 1980s. Um, uh, the and and so we supported it. You know, it's an identity factor as well. Um, it, you can say there's other components to it, but primarily people, especially their orientation, is is something they 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 develop or they they realize over time, uh, and it is an identity. So um, it fit in with the model uh, of uh, disparities, and we focus it on. Um, uh, the central issue of discrimination. Uh, that is also true for people with disabilities. The difference with people with disabilities is they're often a diagnosed condition, right? So, and it's very broad, very heterogeneous, like anything. But uh, you have, you know, developmental disability, Down syndrome, you grow into adulthood. Uh, who, who's your, who, who is concerned with your health outcomes? Uh, they have powerful advocacy organizations. So that is part of it, but there is no obvious institute that says, oh yeah, we embrace this um, uh, people, but anyone with can be, you can have a disability for a myriad number of reasons uh, and and uh, identify as such. So I think it, be, it becomes a little bit more vague. And so in our internal conversations, uh, Monica Webb Hooper and I, you know, uh, decided that we were gonna focus on the intersectional part. That is, so if you're Latino and disabled, you know, we want you in our studies. Now, it doesn't mean we never want to see anyone who's not intersectional because, you know, you need comparison groups, you need some uh, nuance in these issues. Uh, but uh, this is not a, a new area for NMHD. We've always been interested in people with disabilities um, and in the intersection of race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. And I think there is a need for more research. And we published a recent notice of funding opportunity on this very topic with multiple institutes uh, endorsing it. So I, I think that that's the clarification I would make, so. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any questions from the group? Oh, wonderful. Yes, I do have a question. Hi, my name is Cynthia. Um, I'm a sleep medicine specialist and I'm an early investigator. Uh, currently, you know, actually this morning I was writing my specific aims and trying to develop an intervention in Hispanic and Latinos. So after your talk today, this is still kind of keeps resonating in my mind that, you know, Hispanic and Latinos, they have the different backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? And Cynthia, I think we lost your sound. We lost your sound, yes. Yeah, oh, I know. But now it's we, back. It's back. We it's heard back. after you said Hispanics and Latinos have different backgrounds, and then it went silent. Yeah, different backgrounds, and because of because of that, outcomes, uh, symptoms, and risk factors varies according to their background. So, when I'm trying to develop an intervention, and I'm trying to kind of try to do uh, be culturally sensitive and mm -hmm. use these patient-centered care. How do you address this diversity among our, our patient population? You, you're, was, referring, you're referring to the Spanish language differences by national heritage, by background, is it? Yeah, because for example, in the sleep medicine, like we know that the symptoms, symptom-wise varies depending if your origin is from Cuba, from Puerto Rico, from Mexico, for example, mm -hmm. some of them may have some more insomnia or not. So then mm -hmm. when I'm developing an intervention with all this background, then how do you address all this? Because when I'm recruiting, I'm gonna recruit, you know, a diversity Latinos. Right, no, I, I, I hear you. And I think that that's the same question that all, all of us ask ourselves to begin with. Um, you know, even as a clinician, uh, you know, I would have patients when I in San Francisco, my my patients who spoke Spanish came from Central America primarily, also Mexico and any part of South America. And if they would say a word, assuming that I knew what what they meant and I didn't know what it meant, I would just ask him, well, "What do you mean by that?" And I and I learned different terminology that people use for body parts for symptoms that are expressed differently. And so I think you need to know who your target population is. Uh, it's unusual to have, you know, all 20 uh, different heritages represented in one particular area. Uh, yeah. Usually, you know, well, it's Puerto Rican and Mexican. So how do we, you know, they're very different. They are, but we can 
get to them both in Spanish or in English in, in some cases uh, using uh, similar terminology. And, and you know, the, if you listen to the uh, Spanish language media, particularly the, the national TV networks, you see that they use a universal Spanish that is generally understood by everybody throughout Latin America. Um, and so they, they avoid any sort of regional collo colloquialisms and terminology that would only be understood in one particular or, or style of speaking, you know, the, using the voz uh, or that, that kind of thing uh, in, in, uh, in, in what they transmit and people perfectly understand them. So I think that uh, in, both, in both cases, uh, the, the groundwork, so to speak, the preliminary work, the, 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 um, uh, the trial, you know, the, um, the word I'm looking for, uh, the pilots to sort of see how how will this survey work or how will this mm. process work? You learn that or you do some qualitative work. Uh, uh, sometimes staff will, you know, your research assistant staff will will help that way, and and then you test it with volunteers who then can 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 validate or not uh, the the use of different terminology. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do. Uh, national surveys in Spanish, and and we do all the time. The, the Hispanic Community Health Study worked in four different areas: uh, Chicago, uh, San Diego, Miami, and New York. Uh, and they used the same questionnaire uh, for everybody. Uh, and having contributed to that in this visit three, because we we added in a whole module that they gave us the opportunity. So from NIH, I was able to do that. Uh, you know, we worked hard at making the, you know, make this, you know, you pretest, and they they pretested the actual questions cool. with the participants. One of the things we asked them about was about sexual orientation and um, uh, and behavior, and they were worried. Oh, this is going to turn off our people, our our participants, and you know, people kind of took it in stride, and they had no problem with it. So, so for the yeah. first time, we were able to get uh, sexual and gender minority status in the Latino community from the soul study. And I, I'm sure other studies have done it. So. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, so keep at it, you know, it, you have to just, you know, be diligent and and know your community. I mean, I don't know, Cleveland is probably more Puerto Rican and Mexican than anything else. Yeah. Puerto Ricans, yeah. Puerto Rican. our... okay. mm -hmm. So you, you may get, you may be okay using some Puerto Rican colloquialisms. <laughs> and yeah. that could be fine, but in your population, you know, and just like yeah. in San Francisco, we work with primarily Central Americans and some Mexicans. And so there were things that you could do a little differently than if you're aiming for a national sample. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Cynthia. I do have a question. Hi, this is Sophia Cannon. Um, Thank you for your talk, very enlightening. I learned a lot from um, your presentation. I do have a question. So um, I'm at Metro Health. I manage the clinical research operations there, including, including the clinical research unit. And um, so we work at a community hospital, a county mm -hmm. hospital. So you see a variety of a lot of people, people with or without insurance, um, people, that may or may not be documented, things like that. And so, um, for instance, we had a patient last week that um, wanted to enroll in the clinical trial study. Um, I can't remember whether, you know, what um, Spanish-speaking country they were from, but um, we could not enroll. We got through the process, and then we were about to have them sign and everything, and we found out that this person did not have a social security card or social security number. So we could not enroll him in the study because we could not reimburse him for participating in the study. And I suspect that this is not just an isolated event. This is something that probably happens probably more often than other hospitals because we are a county hospital and may increase because now we have um, an increase in migrants, for example, coming from Mexico that are seeking asylum in various cities. And Ohio may not be that place, but it may increase over time. So I don't want to be the person to tell that coordinator, like, well, we can't have this person participate because now I'm denying someone of something 
for, from participating from something that they probably could not control at that moment, you know, whatever their circumstance may be. So how, I guess it's twofold questions. How has the increase of migrants seeking asylum in the states changed or changed I guess, research direction, perhaps? And then how should we as researchers go about um, navigating enrolling patients that would benefit from being in a clinical research study, but they have this limitation of not being properly documented? Right. No, this is a practical question that we, uh, that I think people face. So, the, the majority of us, I think when I was doing research, followed the don't ask, don't, don't tell uh, uh, mantra on this. And you avoided things like asking people for identifiers like social security number. Of course, our institutions say that if you pay someone money, you need to give them, and you need to get some, you know, we need to report this because uh, it's compensation. Um, uh, and, uh, there were workarounds in that a lot of times individuals, you know, had a social security number, quote unquote, that was not necessarily, um, a correct one, you know, a, a real one and, and no one was verifying it. It's not like you put them on a monthly payroll. Um, the compensations are often, uh, you know, whatever, $50, uh, $20, a hundred dollars. Um, uh, and if, if you use, uh, cash, there was often more control uh, from the institution. If you use um, some sort of voucher, uh, that that was easier to not have collect that information. But we, we, I would say that we we never asked for social security numbers when we were doing research empirically, um, and and would look for the ways to make that just not something that we would even do because it would immediately uh, disrupt any trust. Exactly, uh, mm -hmm. and so it it puts your whole and you know the responses at risk, uh, and so figuring out a way to change institutional policy is the best way to go about this, um, because research should be separate from you know what, what we consider legal status, uh, and of course if they if they file for asylum they're legal until that gets decided. Um, and, and so th that person may be protected. I, I think I'm thinking of all the people who, who are actually working, uh, mm -hmm. and, and are undocumented. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that's a different channel. It's, it's estimated about 10% of the Latino population is, is without documents, without to completely legal documents. Um, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of, uh, different area immigrants in the last, few years, particularly from Venezuela um, and also from my home country, from Cuba, although the Cubans have a big community to go to. So it, it, it is complicated. And, uh, and I think that uh, having sensitivity to it, avoiding, um, you know, when you can to ask for such things as social security number, if it can be avoided, I would recommend that. Mm -hmm. And using compensation that is not cash might make that easier. Uh, I mean, you don't have to report, you know, uh, officially uh, if someone's making less than six hundred dollars a year getting. Yeah, arrested. exactly. So there's no real reason to collect social security numbers unless someone's going to be in a very complicated protocol and get, you know, several hundred dollars. Um, so I, I would I, I would push back on the on the IRB processes uh, at your institution on that. So. Mm. That would be my my recommendation. Yeah. You know, we never asked. Um, I always thought that that would be a turnoff. Uh, right. I, people get, you know, the way they, the, well, as an example, the Hispanic Community Health Study, the SOL, the study of Latinos, they they get a, a workaround by they saying, well, you know, you're born in the U.S., okay, you're a citizen. Uh, if you are a naturalized citizen, they ask about that, and do you have re legal residency? And so they don't ask directly, are you undocumented? But if you answer no to all of those three, they assume you are. Mm -hmm. And it's about 10% of the sample, as I recall. And they've done some analyses, uh, you know, with it's it's sort of um, confidential information. So you don't you don't get it with the, the data that you, when you have a protocol approved, you have to 
uh, get special uh, access because uh, it's considered more sensitive, of course. Um, and, and there are some interesting things to, to look at that for, but I, I don't see it as a, necessarily a central issue. Usually where you were, where were you born um, matters more than anything else. So people who, who immigrated as adults versus, the, you know, I immigrated as an eight and a half year old. So I, I feel comfortable in both cultures mm. um, given my trajectory. But so someone would say I was one and a half, you know, I'm not, an, I'm an immigrant, but, you know, came as a child versus you come at 25, you always will have an accent. You, you, you have a certain mm -hmm. amount of background in your country that you're never going to shed, no matter how high the economic and educational scale you go. Uh, and so I think that the, we have other ways to get at the same thing. And so documented status may be important to know for certain things in terms of access to healthcare or certain conditions. Uh, but by and large, uh, um, I, my, my, my general recommendation is that, you know, do, we don't really need to ask most of the time and certainly not a social security number, which is a threatening one. Yeah. I, and I think it's the route of payment, like for example, clean cards and things like that, but you're right. I, that's something to consider. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, we'd like to extend another hearty thank you to Dr. Perez Estable for his time, expertise, and uh, the great Q&A. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here. I'm gonna share my screen very quickly so that you can see our website and our upcoming special population roundtable top topics. So we've got disabilities. We'll be talking about autism. We'll have milestones, autism resources with us in October. Geography, we'll have Julie Altman from Northeast Ohio Medical University, one of our new partners. She'll be talking about Portage and Lucas Counties. And then we close the year talking about disabilities, invisible disabilities, Crohn's and colitis. And we'll have Amy Washington, the executive director of the Crohn's and colitis foundation of Northeast Ohio. The good news is you don't have to register again because you registered for the entire series. So we hope to see you next month. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, Elise. Thank you.